to our attention that it's Miss Bryn instead of Mr. Bryan in the minutes, so oh. we'll, we'll fix that. Okay. Miss, <laughs> uh, it's Bryn instead of Brian that's listed. Oh, oh, yes. Oh. Miss instead of Mr. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else in the minutes? And we'll also entertain a motion to accept the agenda and also the warrants at the same time. So moved. So the motion would officially be to accept the minutes with the changes that Kim noted. And Dave, you're seconding? Mm -hmm. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. All right then. So that would move us quickly on to administrative reports and communication. So we have an hour for our own meeting here, guys, and then we go to the preschool forum at 6. And we did want to have the school board and the principals chiming in on anything on the Articles of Agreement for Act 46. So I guess I'm saying nicely that we might not want to spend a lot of time on administrative reports. I'll be quick. One. Uh, just want to confirm that uh, our Celebrate Diversity activity is this Friday at the um, <coughs> Brattleboro Museum and Art Center at um, 5 to 7.30. We'll have um, student artwork displayed. We'll have a maypole dance going on. We'll have the Oak Grove Intergenerational Chorus led by Andy Davis. We'll have student performances. We will have our own Todd Roach doing uh, some drumming improv. Uh, we will have the famous group Nomad versus Settler, uh, a local band from Academy School. They'll be <coughs> performing along with something called Brat Brock which I think is a compilation of Brattleboro students that play rock. So, please come. This is Rain or Shine on Friday? Rain or Shine. Andy, did you want to? Just to tie, is the board considering 1% tonight? No, we, we sent out the 1% and we've looked at them or we're, we're supposed to be looking at them and then we we have the second meeting in May schedule. Yeah. Is there anything that's urgent on the one percent that you needed approval earlier? Uh, no. Okay, fine. Thank you. Okay, so moving along, let's start with Jerry. Oh. Okay. I'll just pass around my board report, and I think there's um, information that uh, you can just refer to. Uh, Primarily the second page, um, or on the back side, uh, really looks at some of our um, recent school-wide events and some of the field trips. Uh, been already starting, you know, it's very busy April, and uh, May and June is uh, just, as, uh, just as busy. So um, I won't, uh, I'll just draw your attention to those things that you can take a look at later. Um, sorry. Uh, I also have I had a resignation um, for a grade two classroom teacher a while back and um, started um, uh, interviews. I uh, had a 
interview committee of five, uh, two classroom teachers, a special educator, um, as well as um, Lyle and myself. And we had 10 appl applicants. We interviewed six. We invited two back um, to, to teach um, a lesson. And so I would um, like to probably um, nominate um, Galen Kemp uh, for that position. Galen has actually worked in the district since 2006. Um, she currently has been in the uh, first, second, and third grade classrooms as a pair of educators uh, at Oak Grove since 2008. So she has um, had the opportunity to work under some um, very uh, uh, fine, uh, efficient, um, highly qualified classroom teachers, and she uh, understands um, has good knowledge of our literacy programs and our math programs, um, very actively involved beyond her contractual hours um, on our PBIS committee, our MTSS committee, and our technology committee. So she really goes above and beyond. And um, so I would like to make a nomination um, to the board for Galen Kemp to um, be, um, that's my selection for um, grade two. So can we have an official motion? So moved. Second. Sorry. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. And we should pass these back in here. Yeah. And <laughs> that's all I have for right now. So I'll, I'll make it short. <laughs> I know. I almost like the cafes. Moving to Andy. <laughs> it, um, our, our report is coming around. Um, so um, we don't have hirings to announce, but I do have um, two resignations and a leave request. And a what? Leave. Oh. Professional leave. And um, so the reports come around to all of you, and I sense the, the resignations and the leave request to you, Jill, and to Ron, you should have a copy. Yeah. Oh, not by email, I mean right now. Right, right. yes. yes. <laughs> Hard copy in the hand. Right now. So the first one okay. is uh, Deb Cardane, who is uh, seeking a one year professional development leave. She is getting her doctorate uh, at the University of Massachusetts and teaches curriculum, curriculum studies, and reading. Um, and um, you can read the letter, but she would like to request a one-year leave of absence, which would um, mean we would hire a teacher on a one-year contract to replace her in third grade for the next school year. So Andy, I don't think I've seen this before while I've been on the board. Is it normal for us to have to approve a one-year absence? Yeah, it was the contract uh, put this to you. Yeah. Okay. So we're making one motion to approve a one-year absence. I think you have to be, hire for one year. Yeah, because Todd needs to not vote on this. Right. So I think we should do it separately from the resignations. Uh -huh. and, but we're only accepting Deb. Are we also making it clear that we're all, or the position that we're opening is hiring for one year? Yeah. So that would be part of the motion. Yeah. Sure. So perhaps someone wants to make that. Not me. Yeah. You can make it and then not vote. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Better not. So I move we uh, approve a one-year uh, leave for Deb Cardane to pursue educational goals uh, and the hiring of one-year replacement. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. You want to show, I think, Todd abstained. And anyone who's abstaining? Me. <laughs> Thank you, husband of Deb. In case anyone's confused. Uh, <laughs> Then they have two resignations, which um, Pam Mayo, who is a grade one academic support teacher, um, is resigning her position to take a position at the Marlboro Elementary School in Marlboro, Vermont. Um, Pam now lives in Marlboro, and her daughter, her daughter and um, adopted daughter, will go to Marlboro as well. So it's um, a position that she has sought and. Received. Uh, and the other one is a uh, sixth grade teacher, Julie Rosenberg. Um, she and her partner are planning to move to Portland, Maine 
um, this summer. So she is resigning as our sick, one of our sixth grade teachers. So academic support positions, Andy, how are they funded? Um, it's a combination of Title I funds, and then we, we, um, we supplement that with additional funds. Uh, the majority of the funding for this position are Title I funds. And some comes from our local. Are you going to say something? No. Okay. So I think we need a motion to accept the resignations and to refill those positions. So moved. And a second. Second. Any discussion about that? All right. And so all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Any of that? And what was the first name, Viviana? Pamela Mail, M-A-I-L-E. Maybe you want these too. Yeah. Um, have you posted those already, Andy? Or they really really um, the sixth grade position, um, no. Uh, Pam's position, yes, because she actually was offered a con has a contract uh, from that district already. This happened about two weeks ago. So um, I do have a sense of urgency because we're, we're less than eight weeks away from July 1. So this is like we're in, we're in the hiring season right now. So we have to move swiftly before, um, before a lot of the good candidates are swept up. And um, so I'll go to, to the Academy School Report. Um, I just want to, um, on the first page, about halfway down, it says DCF reports. That's the number of um, cases of neglect or abuse that we've reported to DCF thus far that, that we're aware of. Um, it's 28 and growing. And the next column, the next uh, item there is, is a new one to the list, but I thought it was noteworthy, um, number of children that are in foster care. And presently, you know, we include the homeless as a school and as a district. Um, we presently have six children in foster care. Five um, have gone to foster care since December 1st from Academy School. Um, so they're kids that were with us before, but now are They're still with us, but they no longer live with their parents. They were with us before, they're still with us, but they have been put, removed from home by the court because of, um, pretty substantial uh, risk um, and abuse. So, um, and that, we're not unique. Um, the number of children right now in Wyndham County in foster homes is, is somewhere around 135. Um, last year was 83. You could go back historically and it was significantly lower. Um, we're seeing a tremendous increase and the number of kids that are coming to us who are having, um, they, they don't have a parent available to them at home and they're, they've been traumatized, um, they're suffering from um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress, um, or more accurately, it's ongoing traumatic stress that is being inflicted upon them daily. Um, and it's something that we contend with and all, all each, each of us could talk about that in our building about um, you know, how we're, we're attempting to address it. Um, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty alarming, pretty significant. Um, and as a district, I think a community, it's something we need to address. Um, and can maybe, Mark and Terry, can you start putting it on yours too, that same tracking? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just made a note of that. Yeah. Are, we, um, are we equal now on these reports? Are they all the same things? Should be. It should be, yeah. Uh, it's not quite the same line by line. <coughs> okay, it's just different sizes, right? So mm -hmm. different sizes. So given the uh, the form that we're about to have as a supply, I think that's it's a timely um, uh, topic. Uh, other um, in entries or note, um, you see we did we got a kindergarten student in 
and uh, a kindergarten student out. Um, and I don't think there's anything else urgent on there. Um, one thought before we move on for the hirings for you. We have a meeting still in May and June. You, you would expect to have something before we would recess. Um, yes, oh, yeah, we'll, I'd like to have something at our next meeting. And if you don't remind us that we might. Well, it'll be um, need to give that June um, meeting as well, for sure. Green Street Schools report is coming around. Um, just to kind of piggyback <clears throat> on what Andy was just talking about, we currently have nine students who are homeless. Um, I think it's a great statistic to keep um, track of in terms of students in foster care or going in and out of foster care because we certainly have a um, handful of students um, in that situation right now. I'm not going to give a specific number because I don't have that, but I will at the next meeting. Um, but I will say a lot of time and energy uh, in the week before spring break and then after spring break has been um, spent on some interesting living situations and DCF referrals and foster care situations. So it's a significant part of the the day-to-day -day job. Um, rest of the statistics on the front page are um, pretty similar to past reports. We'll just go to the back. So some things I'd like to highlight on the parent and community events. Um, we hosted a science night with Matt Betts in early April. Second year we've done that um, with Matt and Nurse Julia. A tremendous success. Um, Fill the school um, with students and parents um, partaking in different um, science activities and experiments. Um, so that's two years that we've done that and we'll probably continue it. It's been so successful. Um, at our traditional arts night, um, the one I'd really like to highlight is technology night, which we did just last week. Um, first time we put on an event like that. As you know, we've spent a tremendous amount of resources um, into technology over the past couple of years at Green Street. Um, when I started at Green Street, it was basically chalkboards. Um, every classroom now has an interactive um, whiteboard. We're one-to-one -one with Chromebooks, grades three through six. Um, a good number of iPads um, invested into Lego Robotics. A lot of um, technology improvements and uh, Mary Kaufman as part of her leadership um, one of her final projects was to put on an uh, informational night for parents and she put together this technology night it's very interactive um, got great reviews from parents and um, asked us to do it again next year as we continue to implement new technologies so we had about 40 people which is good for the spring with baseball and softball season. Um, it's tough to get people to the school. Um, those sports generally have two to three practices a night in games, so um, I want to highlight that. It was a nice night. A couple other things are um, over the spring break, um, Kevin and Ron, our custodians, um, basically rebuilt our garden, um, took out the um, wood raised beds that were rotting replaced with um, pavers. They look terrific. Um, really exciting news, our tulip trap, the, basically the one fundraiser we do um, for the year. We're up to over $11,000 in donations. Over 200 runners have registered for the race. Um, typically on race day, we can get up to another 100, 100 registrations on that day. So we are on our way to a record um, year for our May 14th event, um, fourth annual. So it's really exciting. We've received a lot of support from area businesses. Um, students have done a tremendous job reaching out. 
it's really um, coming together as a very successful endeavor. And um, four years under our belt, moving forward, I'm, I'm thinking it's becoming a staple in the community as a spring event. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And in the Spino household, I believe there's four generations of you last year? There, yes. Is that and happening again? There will be this year as well. Yeah. I'm sure we'll all be at the end of the pack, <laughs> but we'll do our best. Um, and a few other things I want to highlight is our Green Street School Junior Drama Club will um, be performing. That's actually June 2nd, not May 2nd. Um, at 6 p.m., Diane Cluet started our drama club last year. We have 20 second and third graders who will be performing. And then, um, again, the Town School Theater Program, along with Academy in Oak Grove, also upcoming performances May 13th, 14th, and 15th at the Youth Theater. Those are tremendous shows if you're available one of those evenings. Um, and then um, Teddy Bear Tea coming up on May 19th. So that's about it. Uh, the only other business that we have as three town schools is we had kindergarten registration um, before spring break. So we've met and placed the students. But we also have, um, we had eight families request early acceptance. Um, so their children had turned five after the September 1 deadline. So Jerry, Andy, and I um, reviewed the eight um, requests. Um, we are asking the board to accept six of them based on um, the assessment results of a combination of the gazelle, which is um, an assessment that the parents um, pay for, and also the Peabody assessment that is done during kindergarten registration. Um, so we feel a six out of the eight, a combination of those two assessments and observations through um, kindergarten registration are kindergarten ready. And then um, we have two who, one didn't quite complete fully all the steps that you need to do to complete for early admittance. And um, one um, for the assessments didn't quite match up to the others and don't feel that that child would be ready for kindergarten. So at this point we need a motion to accept the recommendation. Moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any other administrative reports from any of you guys going by? Deb. Just very quickly, we had an um, incredibly successful World Cafe program assessment activity a week ago. We're still tabulating the results. Um, we had David and Mark from the school board there, and that was a welcome addition to our activity. Probably about 75 people in all. Um, the overarching theme or thematic uh, question for that for that two-hour discussion was about how we can better integrate all of what we do at EES, really using using our um, data system more effectively. And the I, I can tell you that <clears throat> preliminarily the responses were really really favorable in that they're an indication that we're moving in the right direction and that um, we are evolving as an agency in terms of, um, you know, using our electronic systems to collect data and actually be able to, to, uh, to analyze that data to inform our strategic planning process. And we looked, we had um, six questions and each of them were, uh, uh, around a 15-minute discussion, and we asked each of the 12 groups to stay uh, with, stay in that group, and not and not move, which we felt was a, a good a good change to our um, revolving model that we've used in the past because there was momentum that happened in the groups, and conversations were able to build from one question to the other. And so we'll probably do that again next year. It was a little bit short in terms of time. The group felt that another half hour would, be, would have been more helpful because we were really doing some deep diving with some of the questions that we asked. And I will 
bring that information back to you probably at our next meeting. I don't know, if, David, if you want to add anything. Uh, it was it was a well designed and well um, implemented uh, process, and the conversations were really enlightening. I was at a table with two um, two teachers from Westminster and two from Esquivel, and. Um, and very insightful, very sharp, um, very committed people, and I was really impressed. And uh, it just, as I mentioned after the meeting, it just sort of re-emphasized the importance of, of finding a way to get these salaries to the point where people take the jobs and keep them. Because any one of these people could, that, that were at my table could work in any one of our schools tomorrow. They're really terrific people, so we need to keep them on the job. We did, and we're working on that. Yeah. The other, the other piece of news is that we have received uh, confirmation from Washington that there will be a 1.8% COLA that comes our way through the Department of Health and Human Services, so we'll be definitely working on putting that toward increasing our salaries, and I believe the directions are that they, that percentage should go across the board, so I will be bringing that recommendation to you when we have that finalized. And um, I hope that you all received a monthly report. We did have a policy council meeting last week. Um, it was a brief one because we, you didn't get the report. Okay, I'll, I'll have Miriam send that out to you tomorrow. Um, because we have been meeting pretty regularly, as you know, around our, um, our refunding application. That application now is ready to leave Boston and go to Washington by the end of this week. So we keep our fingers crossed that we will move, continue to move in a forward direction. That's it. Okay. And this piece of paper here was that? That, um, that is um, kind of late in the game. That is back to <coughs> the situation that we had last summer. I was looking for a date because I think I've already seen one. Yeah, well, it just arrived. It arrived last week, but it's the it's the final it's the final final, and it, it's back to that issue that we had at Sprouts last summer that required um, some intensive um, I, I, don't know, I mean, it, we were, we needed to address we needed to create a corrective action plan, which we did, and. Um, we passed with flying colors back in the fall, and this is the final affirmation that we're clear. Okay. All right, so that takes us on to any policy council, anything to add? I was not, I was at the Act 46 meeting, so I was not at the policy council meeting. <laughs> Energy committee, any, you haven't met with anything? Uh, no. Finance, Mark is not here, but Frank, is anything from SU Finance? Um, we gave him an update on um, health care plans and the transition that um, uh, Beehive Visbed has been um, sh sharing with us, um, progress toward getting their uh, approval from the Insurance Commission of the state. So um, we, we discussed what the scenarios might look like and implications. Uh, and when implications. do we know when they, what they will look like? I think the Insurance Commission has taken action recently. Uh, I'm, I'm going to a workshop uh, next uh, Friday that's going to give us a kind of a briefing of, of uh, possible options. Um, so we'll keep it posted. Diversity you've already done. So um, that brings us to Act 46 updates. What we'd hope to do tonight is to go through one more time the articles of agreement article by article and bring back any concerns any thoughts that anybody has from this group to our next meeting which is in an hour and a half so the um the, the rest of the groups have done that we went through something relatively recently the middle of april there with <coughs> the forum that we did with the public there's um, continual changes on that, so we have the most recent. But I don't know that we actually went through article by article to make sure that there's any comments, and that's kind of what they were asking us to have done. 
Yeah, so the most recent one we sent you yesterday, May 3rd. Did you send all of them? I have it right here. Yeah, I'll get mine to it. Who on the board needs a copy? I have it. I have it. Yeah, I've got, uh, it's a week old. No, but you should have gotten one yesterday. Yeah, I did. I don't have that. We can share. I can give you. I can give you. Oh, he's got one right here. And um, I'll give the administrators copies. Um, I'll probably need to make a bunch of copies for the 7 o'clock meeting here. Okay. Um, I'll see administrators on hand and make accommodations. And Ron, since you kind of know where the changes are, maybe yeah, yeah. you want to lead us through this? I could do that. Um, you looking on, Deb? Yes. Good, thanks. All right. <coughs> you know? Should the members of the public would like to be interested? Okay, so um, this latest draft is a result of um, input from Donna Russo Savage from the AOE and Chris Leopold, our legal uh, consultant for Act 46. So, um, everything on pages one, two, and three, essentially the same. When you go to page four, under um, articles of agreement at the bottom of four, that's where it's changed a little bit. Uh, the previous drafts, we had a question whether districts would be advisory or necessary. And we're getting the opinion that um, and we will get it in writing. I, I think we're supposed to get something by the end of the week or early next week about Vernon. Um, the fact that they probably don't have the authority to withdraw from the study committee. Um, their representatives don't have to come to meetings, but um, there really isn't any sort of, um, just, uh, there's no formal mechanism in statute that allows the board to withdraw from the study committee. So, um, as a result of that action, um, both the AOE and the, um, our legal counsel are saying that you ought to just to decide uh, that everybody's necessary as opposed to pick and choose who's advisable. He said that um, when you try to pick and choose, it gets very divisive. I think throughout this whole process, we knew Brattleboro would be necessary because of the size of the student population. And then maybe other districts would choose to be advisable. Um, but he said, you know, at this point, you probably should all be listed as a, uh, necessary. And if it goes to a vote and one town votes no, then it, you know, you go back to the drawing table. Do you want to, John, do you want to, there's a, article before that that I wanted to have questions about. So do we want to wait until you go through all that and come to the question? No, no, no let's go in chronologically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just above that, the um, under cost implications, yep. the, um, the reduction of the homestead education tax rate would equal a nine, well, you, that section about reductions. Yep. By describing that as a reduction, uh, it, it implies that people are going to see their taxes go down that much. And since the uh, people from the agency and the VSBA came, and the superintendent association came to town, they were very clear that the um, incentives are intended to cushion the process and to help pay for the cost of the transition. It should not be seen as savings, and uh, that the only savings would come from uh, efficiencies. So I think that if, that if we indicate that all of that's going to be a reduction and there aren't going to be any costs, which could consume that and more, potentially, nobody really knows what the costs are going to be. I think it's misleading to have that in there, so I'd ask that that be, that be removed. And after that, um, uh, you had done a, a reduction. <coughs> well, the, the one that I had had a reduction of a million dollars. Before, before you move off of that, yeah. that. So to me, if it said savings, you yeah. would be right. But yeah. reduction, isn't it? I mean, it's a rate. It's a spin. So the rate will be reduced, but there are going to be costs that are going to cover that. But the Some statement's of, correct. 
If you want to get at what you're saying, you're not doing it with what you're saying. Or That's why I'm saying remove it. It's incomplete and misleading. So I don't think it should be there. Well, I think the, the reality is what that statement says, it's true. There will be a reduction. We don't know what the overall tax rate would be. And we have no way of knowing that, right? Well, except Frank had done a projection at the last meeting mm -hmm. based on um, a unified district. And, and you know, he can go through those rates again. It, it does represent a reduction of rates in all districts. So we, we have a, uh, this on a PowerPoint on the uh, Act 46 website, at, uh, on the Wyndham Southeast website. Um, and it's uh, around slide uh, 30 in that um, PowerPoint. We did go over this at our, our last meeting here. Um, at the forum. At the forum, yeah. And um, so it, I, I, think, I think it is a, it is a, a correct um, uh, assessment of, of what has been studied and um, um, the, the benefits of uh, merging. Um, much of our analysis was centered on the uh, legislative report that was requested, the PICA study that was requested by the legislature, submitted in uh, late January. Um, and uh, we, we, we spoke about the siting of the Academy School and Oak Grove School as exemplars in um, demonstrating uh, staffing um, assumptions with excellent outcomes. Um, so be, on that analysis, we have projected what it would look like if we unified our system. And uh, the study committees looked at a document that projected uh, uh, over time potentially $2 million of, of uh, uh, you know, potential savings in operating costs. We, we thought it would be realistic to refer to maybe 1% uh, or 500000 in, in our projections based on a, a gradual implementation of, of, of these staffing recommendations that the, the legislature is uh, considering in this PICUS report. Um, so, so based on a, um, a very careful analysis, um, I, I would say that uh, this, these statements um, do represent what the committee has um, seen. Um, the other thing that uh, this analysis does that's included in the PowerPoint is it, it <coughs> takes out the uh, assumptions uh, that, that are, uh, could be considered um, speculative in terms of what is future state policy going to look like in terms of funding indices. And we simply said, well, what if we, what if we uh, looked at an analysis of, of uh, a unified system under the current um, indices that the state uses? And that's what the, uh, the schedule illustrates, and that schedule illustrates that all towns would see a reduction in taxes, and uh, the reduction ranges from 4% uh, to 9% uh, to without any reconfiguring. Um, and when we reconfigure programs, um, the reductions would be higher as a, as a percentage of taxes. Um, and those numbers translate into two figures, such as for Brattleboro Town, um, approximately $100 per $100,000 of a tax assessment, in that a projected tax rate for the union would be $1.62, and our current tax rate is $1.71. Um, so th th that's, that's the background that we've analyzed and um, in, <coughs> have included in this report. The other one that I object to is the, um, under the examples of potential cost savings, the increase in student-teacher ratios and flexible staffing of a million dollars. Um, I recall when we talked about, uh, we were a, re a librarian who was retiring, and we talked about maybe showing that job, and it turned out that, well, we couldn't really do that because librarians are now also technology integrations, helping students and teachers integrate technology. And then we said, what about the nurses? We're, well, we, are, we have more nurses than the state law requires. What about nurses? And we got a nurse in who explained her day and left us thinking that actually we may need more nurses, not fewer. And um, so it's hard to, um, without specific jobs here like this, you know, the building secretaries aren't going to be necessary because we're consolidated or something. Without, you know, I mean, this is 15 professionals, maybe 30 paras. 
And uh, without some specifics, I think speculation of million dollar savings is also misleading. So, so you see that's stricken as well. Frank had previously given us um, a spreadsheet that looked at all of the instructional areas. The classroom teacher, student teacher ratios, the elective classroom, itinerant teacher, student teacher ratios. Is there any way to get an Elmo here? Mary, because we, we do this a lot, and I think it'd be helpful, like when we go to another page, if we could throw it up. We could hook it up, or is that um, difficult? It's a little bit challenging with this, but you'd have to come over here, or something put the elbow. But I, here. I know it happens during the Act 46 meeting, too, and I often think, well, we have this technology Mark was talking about mm -hmm. beyond chalkboards. If we could mm -hmm. use it, that'd be yeah. Good. Okay. You would have to plug the elbow in here into the machine, so you'd have to stand over here mm -hmm. with well, the elbow. Ron would probably be a little bit. Um, that is. Mm -hmm. I mean, not so much for the moment, but by yeah, the time I mean, we get I'll, to I'll Act 46. I'll give David this copy. Mm -hmm. It's the clean copy that I have, but it, it was, I, th I think it's conservative in terms of. You want this right now? I don't think so, but by the time we get to 7, yes. Maybe, okay. if we can. Sure. So the reference I'm talking about is um, let me just get back to my paper soon. So the previous paragraph where we talk about special ed savings and that was essentially due to um, teacher student ratios changing from one teacher to seven and a half students to one to 12 students. We see the same sorts of um, potentials in a unified system in um, you know, those examples that we have for classroom teachers, lecture teachers, um, academic support, library media, principals, assistant principals, totals. You know, we had something like a 1.9 close to two million. We know we're not gonna do that, but I think incrementally, um, $500,000 is, is probably realistic since 20% of our staff was special ed and we came up with $300,000 in terms of efficiencies. $500,000 I think is, is reasonable. Um, I think over a period of three to five years, a million dollars is very reasonable. Dave, you bring up a great example there with the librarians, and, and we, we had that conversation about librarians and nurses that a couple of years ago, and in the librarian case, we chose as a board to not share the librarian between two schools. We chose to put that money towards a technology position as opposed to cutting back that. Position. Actually, we didn't make decisions at all. We asked about it, and the um, um, gentleman went ahead and, and, and changed the job. We didn't make a decision about it. Well, we still approved the higher. We did, we did talk, yeah. We did talk about it. But the, um, the reductions in, in special ed were, um, I think, it, they weren't necessarily a result of consolidation. It's a cumulative result of change in the operation. We um, stopped identifying or testing kids in the primary years unless they showed really strong and, and um, did the interventions there rather than have them. Uh, tested and, and put special ed in the primary years. That was I mean, the source of those, that those is savings. An, that had an impact, but it also would be- Well, it was a $300,000 impact in our budget. No, but we I'm talking about district-wide, SUY. So it was, it was, the it was, same it was doesn't, definitely doesn't, staff ratios as well. Well, again, ratios, you can change the number, but I think if you don't have some specifics about which jobs are gonna be gone, I don't think that that's really a meaningful number. It's speculative. It may be based on how you think things are going to go, but we've never seen a reduction in staff like that, except in special ed when we change the, pro the operation. So I think, I think I the think key there, though, is that it's not speculative. It's based on a research report. Uh, you know, the PICUS report is based on an extensive analysis of schools that have delivered these sorts of re uh, excellent results that are within the State Board of Ed's quality indicator. Um, so these staffing ratios are not at all speculative. They are based on models that have been proven to work over time. So uh, that, that again is why it's in this report as, as, as a, uh, a claim. So I'm just looking at the clock, we have 10 minutes before we go to preschool. 
And so I don't know if we have time to go article by article this dedicatedly. Perhaps more we should take comments from, now we sent Andy and Mary off on a Elmo chase, but Todd and people that, and Deb, Jerry, Mark, anybody who's not coming on a regular basis to the Act 46 meetings, do you guys have specific things you want to jump to? I mean, Dave will be at the Act 46 meeting, I'm assuming, tonight, right? No, I'm going to do the follow-up with Deb. But that only goes on for like a half an hour. Yeah, another go. So then you'll begin? Yeah, we're off to the Allstate store. So. He's going home. Oh, you're going home. Okay, so then Dave needs to speak up now, too. But I did. Did you have more, Dave? Um, on different articles, well, I don't know if we this, have time. To I don't know what this Vernon thing was going to was about, so I don't. Know yeah, so that's it's uh, modified language from the last draft. It's essentially just gives so them two. Article Two on page uh, five. It's the same thing that we ended with that um, they would have grandfathered the um, seven through twelve students that have school choice now when uh, when they're enrolled in the 2016-17 school year. They would be grandfathered through there until they graduate from high school. So that's pretty similar to what we had. We had, had one version with 10 years. The committee wanted to review that and went with the grandfather for essentially the um, grade seven through 12 current students. So there's, there's really nothing new there. Um, um, page six under Article 7, real estate property. Um, Chris Leopold gave us some specific language that we did not have in the last version that is based on statute. So what he recommended that we create an index of identified property. Putney is concerned about the school for, or the pro, uh, Putney Forest. They don't want Mark getting his hands on it. <laughs> so, so they're gonna they're gonna index that along with I mean there might be other properties like the Crow Lot or you know other things like that to Brattleboro, uh, Fort Dumbo, I'm not sure. The fire station uh, might be something of an issue. Yeah. So you know just just in terms of a school district that, that wants to make sure that their property is protected. So do we have anything do from this board that wants to be put in there? I guess, I guess I would ask, you know, let's think about that for the future, and if there's anything that we Perfect. come up with, we just we'll list that as an index, right? Um, page 7, under Section D, school closure. Um, this is a little bit more consolidated. It has the same um, basic information. For the first five years, there would not be any school closures. Um, there'd be at least four public hearings on school closures in a year and at least two of those public hearings would be held in the community that the school is located in. So that, I think, is uh, consistent with the last draft. Um, under 7 and 8, page 7 and 8, under Article 8, uh, we just put the hybrid um, composition of the board in there, and I think there was a determination by the study committee to go with nine members, three from Brattleboro, uh, one from each school, and then two at large, and so on this eight, page eight, you get the uh, chart of the actual board members. You can see that graph. Then there was a, um, a thought from Chris Leopold based on statute that they should be two, three, and four year terms staggered. And he's gonna give us, um, he's, he's gonna need to plug in. He said those, like where I have one, uh, two-year term for Brattle, or one three-year term, one four-year, and then the other towns. It needs to be balanced, so he's going to do that for us just to make sure that we have it correct. Um, and the rest of this is um, the statute language, language, Article 11, well, 10, talks about the candidates for the boards being voted on at the same time. Um, that you vote on the unified district. Uh, the operating authority is essentially the same as in the old version. I think there's a little bit more detail to it, um, but it doesn't really change anything. Um, Article 12, forming school districts. Um, again, it's the same sort of thing that we, we knew would happen. 
Article 13, local input on uh, policy and budget development. Um, he kept the language there. The, the bold language at the bottom is what the study committee had asked for at the last couple meetings. He encouraged us that um, to get the most democratic process to do Australian ballot. So he's going to have some language on that, and the study committee is going to need to discuss that. Um, Article 15, it, the heading is on page 9, but it goes over to page 10. Um, I think it's important to read his italicized for each operating school building within the unified district, the unified district board shall provide opportunity for local input structures to support, encourage, and recognize local particip participation of advisory groups shall be established by the unified district board of school directors on or before June 30th, 17. Local input will be advisory. The board may create strategies for local participation at each school. We may develop procedures to receive input from schools. And so what he felt was put the list of, um, and if you go to the back of this document, it's got Appendix B, and that's got the local uh, advisory system that we had created with all the details. He said those are real procedural. Um, and so the unified board should essentially establish that and confirm that as your process. Except that that was a big issue for towns and they wanted to have that voted on. Why is, I mean, if we all are feeling like that's a good thing to put in there, why is he saying we have to push it to the unified board? Um, and is what he says? I don't know. I, I, I don't think you have to. I mean, if there was strong feeling that you want them in the articles, I think you could do that. He, as a legal representative, I think he feels it's cleaner this way, but I don't, I, you know, he's going to say if you want to do that. Okay. And I don't think Donna Russo Savage, I haven't heard her be concerned about that, so we can, we can uh, clarify that. Um, now this whole new section on school attendance, this is that school choice transfer setup that we put into the last couple of versions. And, and that actually was a state policy for intra districts, like moving from district to district. And what he put here is intra. In other words, within our union, um, this is the way it should be worded. Because he was, con as you, you can read in the italicized print, but he was concerned that, um, well, there were, there were things that were, were essentially illegal if you're doing it within your district, like transportation and. Um, discipline and you know some of that stuff we had taken out anyway but this clearly is cleaner and it, it's really consistent with um, the current state policy on um, sharing students within your supervisory union so that makes sense and the principals might want to look at these two article 16 and 17 because it does talk about movement of students from one um, the studies committees talked about that and how we might have a family that wants to change from Guilford to come to Academy or whatever. And so how might that happen and what sort of things may need to happen around that? So any thoughts you guys have, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, and there's um, limitations, and I, I don't know that I see it in here, so I want to make yeah, sure we that had that limitation. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll have to... We had a limitation in there. percent And that it was according to what was deemed reasonable by the administrative yeah. input and board decisions. So it wasn't all of a sudden one school would be left with no one or overrun with everyone. That was the idea. Not that we thought it might happen tomorrow, but just in case. It was based on the capacity of what the school could, could accept. You know, like a five percent out or in, and um, that it would not have any effect on staff. Jill, yeah. Can I ask a question. Sure. I don't know if I missed the piece about transportation, but if you if you had a student in Demerston who wanted to come to a school in Brattleboro, what 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 happens to the transportation? Is that yeah, I mean, up to the individual we, family. We would figure it out because you know between special ed and our bus runs, there, there's ways to make it. You know, we have Brattleboro kids now going to Dumberston, the um, intensive service program in Dumberston. So there's, there's, and we've had, you know, we've had families from Guilford come to Brattleboro, and there's a, there's a loop down there that we go so to. So it's kind of be part of that whole does it work and, and yeah. looking at it. 
because we've also heard anecdotally, you know, people would like to send their child because they work right next to that, so the parent would probably be driving the child and transportation wouldn't even come into that. Then kids could, that, that there's sport offered at one school. We did talk kids, about sports. Kids that don't have that sport at their school could access. As long as they're going to that school, they could participate in that sport. Yeah. What do you mean? So if a so Dumberston <coughs> kid suddenly wants to come to Academy and Academy is offering a Zumba class and there isn't anything at Dumberston, that wouldn't work. The kid would have to be attending. They'd be coming to <coughs> Brattleboro and they'd be doing the sports in Brattleboro. So they yeah, can't be going. You can't go to Dumberston and do the BAM sports. Right. I don't think BAM has Zumba. I don't no, but it, it, it has to be, <laughs> you do the sports of the school that you're attending. Yeah, That's so that point. doesn't. <coughs> that doesn't change. Oh. And just the capacity, just so I can read it, because I can't find it in the new version. We, to get it we did also talk about homeschool, after-school activities, and private school. Mm -hmm. And basically, the homeschool would be according to room, and private school would not be coming. Right. Right. So the capacity of a school to receive students from other schools may include limits based on the capacity of programs, class, grade, school buildings, or measurable adverse financial impact. So we'll make sure that that's in this version. So that brings us only to 18. That's the same thing as what we talked about basically before. It's just cleaning language. Yep. <clears throat> okay, so we're now at 6 o'clock anyway for preschool. And so, Lyle, would you like us to all move and you want to set up? Sure, I'll plug in. It sounds like a lot of people in the hallway are they here. Looks like a lot of people. Do we want to change the setup? Recess? Um, it's part of that meeting. Oh, we adjourn to recess. We adjourn to recess. It's part of our meeting. I don't think we're recessing because it's actually part of the meeting was the presentation and here's the meeting. in the Brattleboro area came up at a school board meeting and the school board asked if we could prepare a forum to uh, both hear some concerns and generate some ideas moving forward in the next three, five years with preschool education in this area. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what tonight's going to look like and then we'll actually dive into the real work. Um, we're going to have a short presentation just to give you a little bit of background of, of Head Start and preschool providers. We have a couple of discussion questions, and that's why you're at table groups, and there'll be at least one person at each table group that is facilitating and making sure we take notes. At 7 o'clock, another meeting is happening in this room. So at 7 o'clock, we're going to do our wrap-up around the corner in a fourth grade classroom. Uh, Andy Patchouli said he would lead everybody there. And I believe at that time, where's Paul? Here. Paul. <laughs> I believe at that time Paul's going to facilitate the wrap up and um, do some other ideas. So 
I don't know what we're going to do <laughs> with Bravo. It is a problem. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, um, Jill, don't take a bite because I believe you're going to sort of introduce oh, everything. <laughs> 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 so let's see the first slide of what I'm going to say. All right. <laughs> okay, good. I was thinking I was going to mumble that and interrupt a lot. So, as she said, we were talking and it, we do talk regularly as um, the Brown Road Town School Board has responsibility for the Head Start and Early Head Start programs. There has to be an oversight and it's provided by the Brown Road Town School Board. As part of that, um, we get to hear a lot of fascinating things about what goes on and what's the reality of, of our community. And I see a lot of familiar faces that are much more aware of the realities of preschool than I am even, as long as we work with it. One of the discussions that we have regularly is how to best serve that group of kids, how to have them ready to come into our Barbara Town Public Schools. Um, and are, are we best serving them with the current way that we're laid out and configured? Is it something that we want to change? We've, we've talked for a long time about there's probably a better way. Does it, is it possible and how do we get there? So I asked Lyle to come up with what are we currently doing? And what does the community want? Part of this also came when we were looking at some of the funding that comes down from the federal government. And Deb, how many years has the federal funding been essentially the same? Well, the, 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 the federal funding kind of rises and falls with the political climate. Um, but we've been, on a, we've been on a descending trend now for a number of years. A few years ago, we had sequestration, which we took a heavy hit with, and then they reinstated some of that money the following year, and now again there it's it's you know it's level funded, but they're encouraging us to reduce our enrollment in order to get the salaries up to where because it's been level funded, but not changing the amount of kids trying to be served. And so when we look at that and try to increase the salaries, then how do you deal with the other kids that are in the community, and where sh what should the community be doing? And one of the administrators, I think one of our principals said it really clearly with, you know, if this is not just an EES Head Start, Early Head Start problem, this is a Brattleboro-wide problem. So we thought, let's, let's have some discussion. So actually, I'm sure I'm speaking for everybody on the board, and we say we're delighted that all of you guys are here. Margaret often said when, I was, when she was chair, we don't see a lot of people all the time. So this is great, to, especially to have a conversation that's really vital. Was I supposed to say anything else? No, that's perfect. So, <laughs> uh, Deb Gass mm -hmm. is going to give us just a brief background, a little bit of information about Head Start. So as I just uh, said, we are um, obliging uh, the, the uh, suggestions of our Head Start uh, national office and, and with the encouragement and support of our Head Start regional office to try and um, adjust our enrollment for, for two reasons. One is to lower our costs so that we can actually use some of those funds to help increase our teacher salaries, which all of you who are in the field know as much as I do about what that means. Um, in our, and, and with Act 166, the qualification requirements are increasing so that we need teachers who have a four-year degree in early with certification in early childhood education and we need to be able to pay them commensurately with, uh, with those skills. And so in uh, just, just looking at Head Start and, and just as a reminder, EES also provides early Head Start. So those, those are classrooms for infants and toddlers. We're talking tonight only about our preschool population. At Canal Street, which is basically our Brattleboro hub, we currently have 95 students in four classrooms. And then in Westminster, we currently have 32 students in two classrooms. As you see, those classrooms run the, uh, full days. Um, some, and all of the slots are year-round. Some of our slots are school day, so their children are with us from 7.30 to 4.30. And then we have some half day um, slots, and those half day slots actually do not operate in the summer. 
we, as I said, we have 95 slots uh, in total, with 63 being at Canal. We are proposing a reduction starting in the fall. So we would have four classrooms at Canal Street with 12 children. Right now, we are operating with 15 or 16 children in those classrooms with three teachers. We are proposing that we would drop that enrollment to uh, 12 children in each classroom with only two teachers. So there would be a lead teacher who had the state license with the early childhood certification, and then a teacher with an associate student. And the hours of operation would move from 7.30 to 4.30 to 8 to 4. And we would also have, in Westminster, only half-day slots. We say school day because we're probably, in the proposal with Head Start, we're asking for um, an 8 to 4 schedule. And then we probably will tag on a couple of hours using Act 166 funds. So there's a proposed net reduction of 23 slots, or about almost 24% of the current enrollment for this county. So Deb, maybe you want to say <coughs> proposed and what that means. OK. And I also said, I also mentioned there are actually two reasons. The other reason that we are proposing a reduction in the number of students in the classroom is because, as you know, Head Start serves the neediest of the needy. And we have a rising number of challenging behaviors in the classroom so much that they're almost exclusively that way. And we really want to lower the enrollment so that um, we can do a better job of providing those services to support those children in a more individualized approach. Um, and so proposed means that it's proposed, that it has received the, um, the support of our Bridal Road Town School Board and our own Head Start Policy Council. It's currently sitting in Boston and being reviewed. And I can also tell you that this is a, the third rendition of the original proposal, which was much more drastic. And um, the word is that it will be leaving their office this week and moving to Washington, D.C. for their review and approval. And they really do review it. It's not a rubber stamp process. Unfortunately, Janice Stockman could not join us this evening. But I believe Paul Smith is going to talk a little bit about the preschool partnership. So over the past several years, um, Brownsboro Town School District and the other town school districts um, and school districts across the state of Vermont have engaged in partnerships, contracts with um, private pre-K providers to uh, arrange for 10 hours of publicly funded, 10 hours per week during the school year of publicly funded pre-K education. Um, the current status, um, the partnerships uh, exist with uh, 19 providers at this point. Um, the, for the providers, the, the, the sort of conditions for the, for the contract is they have to be four or five star rated uh, for uh, the Vermont's, Vermont's um, rating system for pre-K programs. Uh, they need to provide a licensed early childhood educator. Um, assessment, uh, development, and learning twice a year. There's a particular piece of software that they use for that. And uh, use the Vermont Early Learning Standards. Currently, for Brattleboro, there are 107 kids enrolled in that program getting 10 hours of pre-K per week. So, our directions for the evening, originally we were going to break up into a couple of different groupings, but because our time is a little bit tight and because the space is a little bit tight, I think it'll, be, it'll work better if you just stay at your table group. Um, each group will have two questions. Um, we're going to try to make sure, it looks like groups are pretty even, but if you feel like there's a lot of people at your table, we want to make sure everybody has a chance to, to uh, have uh, time to talk. Um, there is a facilitator, it's either a board member or um, an administrator at each table that will sort of take notes and, and get you going. And as we said, there will be a debrief session um, around the corner in a classroom. 
um, and a chance to talk about um, what we talked about tonight, um, report out, and maybe some next steps. And that will happen right around a little before seven. We'll leave them together. So, question number one. How are we presently meeting the needs of preschool students and what changes should we consider? So if at your table, um, you can talk about that and yeah, take some notes. I'll be your timekeeper, so in about 15 minutes or so, I will bring us back together and move us to the next one. Start with people to say the name and what, why you're interested in the preschool. So my heart is in the beginning. the value. Education. This question one, how are we presently meeting the needs of our preschool students and what changes should we consider? Uh, 972 of them are ages 3 to 5. Um, there's currently 612 preschool slots in the county. How many? Right, so I'll just start. Um, about half of them need that I see on them is that we can provide all kinds of preschools. The kids, especially the ones who most critically need to get to preschool programs, don't have transportation. And they can't get there. There are so many. We just have a most of my days are spent over here with Head Start for the children there and the family. So I think, as everybody else at the table, just getting a really strong start. Hi, Michelle Thompson. I work at Green Street School right now. I think is I don't know that every kindergarten teacher does it, or but I think that it's kind of their invitation. Yeah. So we're doing it. Right. Um, I think it's really good. Um, I think it's really good. I think it's really good. I think it's really good. I think the teachers might have last week was well, where can we go to find that information instantly? If, this, if something else happened to the child along the way, or, or any, just any updated information, or if they're receiving a new service. Uh, uh, so I'm going to move on to question so, number no two. No surprises there, but having that good, having um, a stable staff. The question is, what does the community want from the Brown House School Care for Preschool Education? So, uh, you can, if you're still working a little bit on the first, go ahead. I would just write it on the big Some schools, they're only paying for 10 hours a week for these children. But there are some school districts, only 10 hours a Oh, I think they were four kindergartens. I didn't know so I want to still have them be for the for those kids. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I just like I guess so. I have no idea how they're going. Because they're going full time. They're, they're going full time. They're going full time. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
going back to the attendance council. One of the things that happens is every seat can happen right now. So you could finish up this. When money comes from the state, the control is not part of it. And the. Okay, we are going to transition and um, the wrap up will take place in the classroom down the hallway. There are chairs stacked uh, as you go into the classroom on the left. Uh, Paul has graciously offered to facilitate that, but if you take your uh, papers, um, you'll have a chance to.